This is directly related to what we call the gods, the titans. So what they need to do is come up with an alternative story because you can't cover this up. See clearly where the bark is. They've become exact statues, exact statues of their former selves. The thunderbolts of the gods. This might be one example of those thunderbolts. Hurricane Force winds through 175 million tons of dirt in all directions. But as you can see, there's no debris all the way around Meteor Crater. Not rain, no. A river, no. No way in a million years. The Arizona desert, home to many strange rock formations, but perhaps none as strange as the petrified forest, meteor crater, and the Grand Canyon. While mainstream academia may have closed the book when it comes to the origins of such historic landmarks, truth seeker and esoteric historian Jay Dreamers believes there may be more to the story than we're told. Now, what I refer to as our ancient oblivion is a period that's missing from the historical record. This is an entirely alternative version of prehistoric times. Traveling deep into the Native American wilderness, he'll research and explore these anomalies of geography firsthand, starting with the petrified forest. Now, when you look at these petrified trees, you can see clearly where the bark is. You can see the bark line right there. Many times you can see the concentric rings and things of that nature. Everyone accepts that these trees have turned into rock, that they've turned into stone, and they have been perfectly uh, petrified. They have become exact statues, exact statues of their former selves. Using comparative mythology, we have the tools available to us to reverse engineer history itself. And we can look into the anomalies that are everywhere. These living biological organisms that once grew and flourished turned into stone. These trees turned into rock. Mud fossil theory states that at one time in our hidden prehistoric world, that entire ancient world had at one point in time, by some means, been petrified and all life turned into rock. All life turned into stone. Whether it be organic, inorganic, animate or inanimate, all life petrified and turned into rock. So if we can accept that a biological life form like a tree can petrify and turn into stone, why can't we accept that other biological life forms in the distant past also did the same? There's also the interesting case of Girolamo Segato. Now, a lot of people would think, when they first hear about mud fossil theory, most people would think, well, organic life decomposes. You know, you can't take organic life and change it into rock, but you can. And Girolamo Segato knew the secret to petrifying the human body. Mud fossil theory states that at one time, most of the world's surface and all life in it petrified and became the rock anomalies of the world we see today. So the question is, if this can happen to our trees, wouldn't this shed some new light on our myths and our legends and our stories, oral traditions that have been passed down to us and giving rise to many of our best legends and myths, which are truth preserved in story form, like the story of Medusa who turned her enemies into stone or the trolls who turn into rock when the sunlight hits them. Or how about the story of the gargoyles? A gargoyle is symbolic. It's a reminder of that perpetual curse that there was advanced technology used to change people into stone. Haven't you ever wondered, how did we go? You've got to ask yourself, how did we go 
from a golden age where the gods lived and had advanced technology and there was a garden paradise and life was great, all of a sudden to an age of rock, to the stone age. What caused that transition? Mud fossil researchers believe that the answer lies in the petrification of the world, ancient technology that was used as an end-all, be-all, for the war between the gods and the titans. If the rocks of this land are accepted as having once lived and breathed, then perhaps there is more than just myth to be found in the legends of the world. Meteor Crater, destination of over a quarter of a million visitors a year, and home to the most well-preserved meteor impact site on the planet. Or is it? Moving at 11 miles per second, a meteor raced through the solar system towards Earth. Immense shockwaves were created as it approached from the east. Hurricane force winds drew 175 million tons of material in all directions. The shock of impact melted most of the meteor and spread it with a large plume of debris. But as you can see, there's no debris all the way around Meteor Crater. At least, no discernible degree. Um, not the amount of displaced rock and rubble that we would expect to see. So what they say is that it's all been vaporized. It disappeared, essentially. This place has special significance because it's directly related to the gods. It's got nothing to do with a rock smashing down into our world. It has everything to do with our ancient and hidden past where we had an alternative sky, an altogether different looking world. Our world back then looked alien to us. And these are national monuments, all these places that are preserved, especially here in Arizona, they're directly tied in to our ancient past. So what they need to do is come up with an alternative story because you can't cover this up. You can't, I mean, you could try to fill it back up with dirt, but they're not going to do that. So they roll with it, they go with it, and they come up with a different story. And that's why when we walked in to the visitor center, you see so much NASA propaganda. Proponents of the electric universe have a different idea, inspired by a renegade scholar named Emmanuel Velikovsky. Emmanuel Velikovsky put forth a theory of an alternative cosmos, an early and ancient cosmos where the heavenly bodies were at one time, according to his theory, much closer to the world that we live on today. Now, when those heavenly bodies would pass one another, they would release uh, an electrical discharge between them. This became known as the thunderbolts of the gods. This might be one example of those thunderbolts. There was a different cosmology. There was a different understanding about our world and the lights in the sky above us. Manuel Velikovsky put forth a daring and bold assertion 
that our sky has not always looked the same, that what we call planets were at one time much closer to the surface of our world. And because the planets, or the lights, uh, the luminaries in the sky, were so close to the surface of our world that they engaged one another as they passed by one another, and it had an effect on the atmosphere and the air. But if we listen to some of the suggestions of Emanuel Velikovsky, we'll soon see that if in fact it was an electrical discharge between some heavenly body that was up there and our world down here, this is exactly what we should expect to see. And that even some of the ancient and earlier people venerated those heavenly bodies that we now call planets. And that they named them after the gods. And they were constantly fearful of those gods because they could do things like this to our world. Now, what Emanuel Velikovsky was referring to is what I call the Arcadian sky. This was the, how the sky looked during the ancient times of Arcadia and Atlantis and Lemuria. The times of the prehistory that's been kept from us, the sky itself was altogether different looking. As those luminaries passed one another in the heavens, they sometimes released an electric discharge between the heavenly bodies. Also, at times, between our surface of our world and those heavenly bodies that were near at the time. Now, the question is, could those heavenly bodies have been used as a form of advanced technology in the war between the titans and the gods? Are they related? Could they be related to mud fossil theory and the petrification of our world? Is that why we have the stories of the trolls turning into stone when they see the light of the sun hitting them? And when those heavenly bodies, those lights in the sky, passed near enough to one another, there was released an electric discharge. And and this became, possibly, the thunderbolts of the gods. This was Zeus's lightning bolt. And this, not meteorites from space, not rocks crashing into our world, but the thunderbolts of the gods could be what is responsible for so many of the anomalous craters that not only we have here on Earth, but we also see on the moon as well. When the gods would war with one another and Zeus would throw his lightning bolt down to the earth, it would cause a crater. It would rip out pieces of the world and it would obliterate them, throwing them in all directions, leaving behind a crater that we have possibly mistaken for a crater from a meteor. If you look at obelisks, an obelisk looks exactly like a lightning conductor. It looks exactly like something that would harness the energy that was given, the immense amount of energy that was given by the gods themselves. And maybe that's where we get our obelisks from. Maybe the obelisks were there to draw the energy that was coming down from those nearby heavenly bodies. Or perhaps the obelisk was used to deter the path and the flow of that electrical current to take it to somewhere that was safer and outside of the main cities and outside of the populated areas. Now, once those heavenly bodies returned further back into the sky and it was now safe, now we have those obelisks as a type of religious relic. And now they're venerated because those are from the time of the gods. Those are from the time of the Titans and the war between the gods, uh, the war in heaven between the gods and the Titans themselves. And so what they do is they take the obelisks that are no longer needed, they venerate them and they bring them into their cities as symbols for the time that once existed, known as our ancient oblivion, or the time where the gods lived and walked among us. In school, we learned that the Grand Canyon was carved out of the earth by the flow of the Colorado River. Where are the canyons of the mighty Mississippi, the Amazon, or the Nile?
I've seen pictures. Everyone's seen pictures. We've seen videos, pictures, showing all of this mighty splendor. And I have to be honest, when I got to Meteor Crater, I thought it was gonna be a lot bigger. I thought this would be a lot smaller. This is one of those things that even me showing you will not do it any justice as to how gigantic it is. We're able to look at our geography, especially those anomalies that exist in the world that we chalk up to things like wind and rain over millions of years. Well, erosion works to break down preformed objects. Erosion is constantly working on the things that already exist in order to make them look worse, to break them down. But erosion is not purely responsible for most of the world's geographic anomalies. The reason I'm upset is because of what I've been taught about how something like this has been made. A river, water, carving throughout the canyon. Now if you look at the Grand Canyon, you can see that it looks like it's very chiseled. It doesn't look like what we would expect to see from running water. If you have running water, it's going to smooth out the edges and the corners. The Grand Canyon looks just the opposite. The Grand Canyon has very rugged features, almost like it was chiseled out and carved out. What if the Grand Canyon was a part of the terraforming of our world. There are many hundreds of sharp angles, 90 degree angles, 45 degree angles. Um, almost every, every geographic feature that I have seen with my own eyes here says nothing to me and speaks zero of any type of water curving it out. Not only that, but this is so gigantic i can't even begin to put it in words in person it's very much awe inspiring nothing could have made this naturally this was uh something that was done extraordinarily either by titans themselves who all of our ancient religions and cultures all agree on and speak of the giants themselves using this particular area as some sort of a quarry Many truth seekers around the world propose and are starting to see that there may be more to the Grand Canyon and the story of its creation. Even here in the Americas, we've got our myths and our legends. Take Paul Bunyan, for example. Paul Bunyan, according to the legend, was a titan that terraformed our world. Wherever he walked, he left behind holes that filled up with water and they became lakes. The story says that Grand Canyon was carved out by Paul Bunyan's axe as he drug it along behind him through the Colorado Plateau. Now, when looking at the story of Paul Bunyan, he had Babe, his blue ox, his giant blue ox, an exact replica of the Norse creation story of the world, where you had Ymir. Ymir was the father of all of the titans and all of the giants. He was their grandfather. And Ymir had a companion who was a giant cow. And the giant cow, Audamla, was basically the origin for Babe, the blue ox. We have our myths and our legends that directly touch base with some of the ancient myths and legends and the older stories that give us a better and more full picture of our history. This is directly related to what we call the gods, the titans, the giants, the elven race, the Anunnaki, somebody besides ourselves, because we know this, we did not make this. Mankind did not make this. Somebody did. Something left this scarring behind. The main responsibility for the titans was to shape the world. They were the movers of mountains. They were the carvers out of the oceans. They were the ones who gave our landscapes such interesting and sometimes anomalous and unique formations. The Titans' primary responsibility was to shape and form the world to prepare it for the next, for the beings who would come afterwards, which were the gods. And then the gods had their responsibility to prepare the world for who would come after them, which is mankind. Now it's beautiful, it's very majestic, don't get me wrong. It's very nice to look at. And I very much appreciate it. I'm, I'm gonna look around a lot more and see what else is here. If we were to ask the native peoples of America, 
about the history and the origin of places like the Grand Canyon, they would have more of a reverence, they would have more of a spiritual connotation to the events that had happened, and they would relate the creation of the Grand Canyon and the land itself directly to the time of the gods, and directly to the time of the giants. And they knew that the giants were directly responsible for the creation and the look of our world today. But it is evident by all of the features in this place that I've seen with my own eyes, this is not naturally made. Something else made this, just like you would expect to see in the television show Westworld, where they take huge machines and they just carve out their own uh, geographic features. That's exactly, exactly spot on the money what this looks like. And that's not me guessing, that's not me wanting it to be anything else. Anybody can look at this and say, no, not rain, no, a river, no, no way in a million years. Perhaps it's time for us to re-examine and revisit some of the fairy tales or children's stories. Our myths and our legends are truth told in story form. There is truth to these stories, and they have been passed down and handed down to us so that one day we would come back to them. One day we, re we would return to our origins with a childlike mindset that we would reconsider the shape of our world. We would reconsider our origins of who we are so that we can know more about where we come from and have better purpose in our present time and that will give us the drive and the inspiration and the knowledge that we need to plan for our future. Jay Dreamers believes that myth is truth told in story form. And those myths and legends will be the breadcrumbs we find to lead us home. Is it possible that during this war between the gods and the titans, that super advanced technology was used in order to end the war completely by turning the rebels, by turning uh, the enemies into rock, into stone? And perhaps that technology was blacklisted.